Hello and welcome. This is a, uh, an exclusive interview today with John Spence, who is the founder of Karma Resorts. Uh, John is going to be joining us from somewhere in an exotic island, not Bali this time, but Mykonos in uh, the Peloponnese, I, I think, about one of the Greek cha chains of islands. No, it's not Peloponnese, is it? It's the Aegean That island. is. Yes. Yeah. But John um, has a, a very interesting background, which involves uh, appearing on stage in bin liners and playing in punk bands. But he moved on from there to become one of the world's entrepreneurs in tourism development. He had a vision to create a holistic, connected community of unique five-star properties linking like-minded individuals, people who wanted to own unique properties in his resorts. He's got 30 resorts so far, um, primarily as far as I know in Indonesia, where we're talking from, uh, India and Australia, but probably more than that that we know about. Um, we're going to ask him where it all started, where it's all going to, how he's doing, and um, what the vision is for the future. So, John, welcome. It's been a while since we met, um, which was in the company of the Miss Universe girls in Karma Kandara swimming pool. Um, Miss Universe Australia girls who were promoting um, themselves and Karma at the same time, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I don't think we were actually in the swimming pool, but probably no, quite. We were at near the swimming pool, <laughs> uh, but would it be nice to have been in the swimming pool? You're quite right. Yeah, yeah, possibly. John, let's go back. What inspired you to start Karma Resorts? What was it that took you from being a, a musician, or at least a, an amateur musician, to being an entrepreneur in tourism? I, I think it, it, many accidents, to be candid with you. I mean, my life has been a chain of uh, fortuitous events, possibly having good karma. Uh, as you know, I started off uh, in music. I left university after two terms because I thought I was probably the best guitarist in the world. And I swiftly discovered I was the worst guitarist in the world. I got one of the words wrong in my statement. And I drifted in, this is back in 1980. I mean, it was very, very hard to be a bad guitarist, really, because most punk bands prided themselves on having bad guitarists. But I drifted into the music business side. I ended up as a tour manager, uh, an agent of bands. And I traveled the world with a number of bands. Some of them became very successful, like the Rhythmics and Banana Rama, Culture Club and various other ones. Most didn't. And I lived on the road for many years. I've always loved travel. I've loved tourism. I like flying. I like hotels. And in 1984, I drifted into the hotel industry uh, in Tenerife which is in the Canary Islands in Europe, working for an American firm who are developing resorts and, uh, and hotels. And I started off very much at the bottom of the food chain. I was a, a junior salesman and I worked my way up in that company until I ended up running it. And then I left in 1993 through an accident. I was invited to go to India to speak at a conference about our business and how it was working in the West. And I fell in love with the country. I went to Goa and I saw huge opportunities. I saw beautiful beaches, land which was relatively cheap to buy. I saw an emerging middle class who wanted to have holidays and to, to experience some of the lifestyle of the West. And I saw a destination which was just beginning to be discovered by um, Europeans taking relatively low cost winter sun vacations. So rather than go to the Caribbean or to the Seychelles or uh, Mauritius or wherever, they were flying direct into Goa. So I, I went back to my bosses at that time. I, by that time, I was the MD of the company. And I told them about what I thought was a great opportunity. And I, I would say they virtually laughed me out of the house and uh, uh, didn't believe in Asia and had this very Americanized view, I think, that Asia was full of poor people and whereas the money was in the West. And I, I took a, a gamble and I quit and I sold my flat in London and I cashed in my savings started my own company. I managed to persuade some of the people that worked with me to come with me on my adventure. And we went to India and we opened up our first resort on the beaches of Goa, which is a vastly underfunded venture. We had like one computer between us, I think. And we had the sales department use it in the day. At night, marketing would use it. And overnight, the accountants would use it because everyone hates accountants. So let them do the night shift. And we lived in non-air conditioned accommodation and we had one resort and probably by all reckoning, it should have failed. I think in Europe, they were taking bets how long it would last for me to go back with my tail between my legs. But it didn't. And it was a great success. And we we grew from that one 
small lake on big oaks grew we grew from one resort and we expanded in india and over the years we then discovered indonesia we we went there one year after we started with our first resort in bali and we developed many resorts in indonesia and we've been in many countries all over asia now and as you, you said we currently have 33 resorts although we, we can talk in a moment about the pandemic but we've been buying a lot during the pandemic and it's going to be closer to 40 by the end of this year and we're now very present over europe as well as in southeast asia and and of course australia so yes it's 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 what what inspired me well a love of travel a love of holidays a love of hotels uh, i was inspired by the opportunity in asia i saw it very much as an emerging market we called the company karma and i could be criticized by this by people who understand the, the proper philosophy of karma far better than I do. But in a simplistic way, the karma being that if you give good things to the universe, the universe gives good things back to you. And this has always been our mantra, whether it be in our development and our philanthropy or many things that we do. And it certainly has proven that way for us over the years. And very much with our products, we are trying to create a club. We, we see ourselves much closer to a club like Soho House, for instance, than we do to a normal hotelier. So we have membership plans. People join us for a year or for multi years or periods. And so we view it as developing a relationship with our clients. And we have over 45,000 member families at the moment, rather than just being somewhere for them to stay overnight. So that expands into our whole philosophy that we really think we're not in the hotel business. We are in the entertainment business. And that's why we spend so much time and effort on providing experiences. And people talk about experiential tourism, but I think that's what we've always been into. It's not just about where you stay or what you eat. It's about interacting with other people, interacting with the community, having great spa treatments or bars or restaurants or wine or whatever it, ever it need be. So that's, I mean, it's a, it's a great history and it's a, it's a, a dive in the deep end, uh, which you took and, and it happened. Um, 33 resorts so far going on to 40, taking advantage perhaps of the uh, downturn and the, yes. the fact that people want to get out of the, the business. Um, look, has it, has it been implemented the way you saw it happening or have you had to make adjustments along the way? Um, uh, yeah, we're all, uh, us foreigners in Asia, are always accused of misusing uh, local terms like karma uh, and so on and so forth. But yeah, giving good things and getting them back in, in return is, is a very good way of doing any business, to be honest. But have you, have you, have you felt that you've done the right things? Um, what, what would you do differently if you started again now? Yeah, well, I, I think I think there's, there's there's several questions in there, which I, I think are all very valid. I mean, the first thing is, did it go according to plan? Of course not. I mean, I am I am deeply suspicious of any entrepreneur who says they had a business plan, they for executed it to the plan and it succeeded. I mean, that's nonsense. I mean, being an entrepreneur is really treading into fresh water the whole time. And, and you have to be flexible. I mean, I, I often describe one of our secrets of success over the years often we've succeeded against the hospitality majors, the, the big names, is because we're fleet of foot. We're much, I own 100%. We, we have no outside shareholders. We have no debt. So we can change our minds 10 times a day. We can, we can make new decisions. We don't have to stick to a certain plan. And that has enabled us to take advantage of opportunity all over that, the world, but to talk about Southeast Asia since we've been there, we'd never have worked if we had a rigid structure because you have to change the whole time. You have to be fluid. It's the same in, 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 in warfare. It's why, you know, Vietnam was never been taken or why um, various countries, if you are able to be a guerrilla warfare unit, you'll always beat the big army that comes into you. And I often describe our business as being a little bit like a speedboat. We're competing with the Marriott's or the Starwoods of the world, all these monster liners and these cruise ships. And yes, they're much bigger, but it takes several miles for them to be able to change direction, whereas we can change direction immediately. And we're also not frightened of taking risk. I mean, I, I'm very honored that I teach at Yale, the university, and I teach the students there um, really contrarian ideas. They're taught everything about risk aversion, about doing a business plan, doing a spreadsheet analysis, making sure that you don't endanger the shareholders' money or equity or whatever. Uh, whereas I say, no, you have to make mistakes. If I've got a manager that was proudly say to me, I've never made a mistake, I'd probably fire them because without making mistakes, you don't learn to go forward to the next step. The thing I think with Asia which, which alluded, you alluded to in one of your questions there. We have always had the attitude that we're guests in Asia. Uh, we're not coming to Asia to tell people what to do or how to do or run a business our way. 
we always, right from the beginning, we've gone into a territory, whether it's where we developed a resort, where we've had a marketing office, where we've had some kind of presence. We have employed local people, not only from that country, but from that region of that country, often. We've trained them, empowered them, and then we have left. So the majority of the people that work in Karma, which is almost 5,000 people, are local people in the local area. So when we are in Bali, almost all the people dealing with our Indonesian business are, are Indonesian. When we're in India, in India, out of a, a headcount of 2,000 people, I have one non-Indian. That's all. And that's a lady who is partly Portuguese, partly Goan, and she's lived there for 24 years. So we've never had the arrogance of a lot of other companies that come into Asia and try and tell them how to do it, nor a lesson we learned at the very early stages, which again, I think some hoteliers don't really understand, is, is you can't talk about Asia. You, you, you can't even talk about India. You, you've got to talk about Goa and Maharashtra. You've got to talk about Jakarta and you've got to talk about Bali. I mean, the difference between local areas is so extreme. So we learned in the early days, the only way we would succeed is by empowering local people, enabling them to succeed and enabling them to drive the business in each territory. Other lessons we've learned over the years, it, 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 it's been astounding to us over the years, the speed of wealth creation and um, growth in Asia. Again, I think I talk to people that haven't experienced that, and you know it extremely well, and they just don't understand it. I mean, and also the youth of the people in Asia, the average age of people consumer spending. We, we've realized and we, we've always uh, we always have thought this over the years, but we've realized more and more that our product is perfect for the Asian consumer. It's the fact there is some sense of membership. There's a social responsibility attached to it. There is an element of a guaranteed quality product at the end. And it's more than just a holiday. So, yes, I mean, we've learned a lot over the years and we continue to learn. I, I think if there's any sort of week that goes by that I haven't learned something, then I'm not keeping my eyes open. John, um, that's uh, it's good. I mean, it's absolutely good to hear that um, this journey is one of learning. We're all in the same boat here. But we've had another lesson to learn recently about COVID, the unexpected coming up to bite us when we least expected it and continuing to bite us now. How has karma been affected? I'm sure once again, it's been affected different ways in different places, but what's changed um, with the onset of this extraordinary pandemic. I mean, COVID has been a bit of a curate's egg in that there's things about it which are terrible and things about it which are actually quite, I use the word, guardedly positive because I wouldn't want to put a positive spin on COVID. But there has been elements of karma which have actually been beneficial from what's happened in the last year. I mean, anyone says it hasn't affected their business is clearly lying, particularly in hospitality. It's affected us less than we feared, I think is the word to say on that. I mean, we, we went from going back in time to March last year, I gathered my senior managers, we could see the storm approaching and we all met in in um, Dubai for a board meeting, there's about 10 of us. And, and we all left with the view that the world was going to change very swiftly and there were going to be lockdowns. And I think we all said we probably won't see each other again for, oh, two months. Oh, no, it won't be as long as that. Or someone said three months. And the majority of them, apart from these Zoom conversations, I still haven't seen since that time, March 2020. Uh, and, and we knew that we'd have to shut resorts and temper things down. Within seven days, we shut all 33 resorts. We shut 70 restaurants. And we had, you know, suddenly a payroll staff of, almost 5,000 people that we were having to support because operations had stopped. So it was scary. <laughs> you know, I, I'd be lying if I said I didn't probably have a couple more beers than I should have done and a few sleepless nights. But, but we got through it. And I think, look, the first thing we did is we adapted. And I, I, I hate to use the American phrase pivot because I don't really like it, but I think it is relevant here. We did pivot. We changed. We, we did a lot of work. We decided that the key thing was to communicate with owners. And so we set up a lot of channels where we spoke with our owners because unlike a vanilla hotel company, this is 45,000 families that are part of our team. And so we, we ran lots of programs with them. We, we communicated with them. 
we actually did quite a few upgrade sales and people bought more and wanted to invest in the future via Zoom and various different channels. As soon as we started coming out of the strict lockdowns, we realized that tourism was going to be domestic for quite some time. And so we invested in, in domestic channels. In Australia, for instance, we invested in some camper vans. And so our clients could still take their holidays. And whilst before they'd have got on a plane and went to Bali, they went down the road and got in as one of the camper vans that you can sleep in and did a tour of the state forest down in Margaret River, for instance. And we looked at these policies everywhere that we could, we could implement. As a company, we took a decision that we would make no one redundant. And as you know, um, unlike territories like England and um, uh, Germany, where we could rely on state support, in most of our territories, there was no state support. And clearly, if we weren't paying people, then no one was. And so we started off local programs, a number one, retaining payroll for everyone and also running food support packages in the community in Bali and also over in India. So we, we broke open the fire, the, um, uh, the war chest, so to speak, and invested money over a period of time because our commitment was if we look after everyone now, then they will repay our loyalty in the future, which has certainly come true. We took it as an opportunity to relook at the way we ran our business. And there was a lot of areas that we realized we didn't need to do going forward. And so we restructured costs and we restructured our structure around our big, one of our big bonuses, unlike most people in my industry, is we have no debt. So it wasn't slithering into this and suddenly every month the bank is asking for money or some outside shareholder is asking for their payment. As I said before, I own 100%. We have no debt. So although money coming in, not coming in is not good, it's not as bad as if you have to be paying quite a lot out, which enabled us to look after all the staff. Then real, as, as then what we saw, um, to begin with, it, the whole world shut down, as we all know, for two months or whatever it was. We were all stranded in different countries. Virtually all the resorts were shut. It was clearly just a time of um, concern. And also from a personal point of view, though, it's quite strange. Looking back on it, I find it quite cathartic. I mean, I've spent my entire life since I was 20 living on planes. I travel an average of 180 days a year. And so suddenly to do nothing for three months, it's like ground day and be stuck at home. Uh, it was it was quite positive. And I came up with a lot of ideas. I spent very good quality time with my family. There was, there, there was, there was good sides from a personal point of view. Having come out of that, what we've seen very much is it's a roller coaster. Uh, countries open up, so therefore resorts open up, and then inevitably those countries tend to shut down again, so resorts shut down. So because we are so spread out and we have operations in England, in Germany, in France, in Italy, in Greece, we're about to go into Spain, uh, we have operations all over India, we're in Indonesia, uh, Vietnam, Thailand, Australia, because we're so spread out, luckily it's meant, and I touch wood as I say this, that there's always been somewhere open, somewhere shut, somewhere open, somewhere shut. And so we were able to relocate assets and move things around much more efficiently than we feared at the beginning when everything was shut. And what we've seen on the domestic tourism is that when a resort can be open or a restaurant can be open, and when a consumer can get to that restaurant or resort, they will with a passion and they'll actually enjoy themselves more. And I think there's several psychological drivers here. Number one is there's more liquidity. So people have got more money in their bank accounts than they would have done without COVID. In the United Kingdom, the Chancellor Exchequer, Rishi Sunak, recently estimated there's 200 billion pounds of excess savings in individual people's bank accounts in the United Kingdom alone because they haven't been able to spend it. They haven't been able to go on holidays or go to restaurants or go out. So people have money. Um, I think also psychologically, people want to reward themselves for being locked down. So when they can go, they will. And they'll say, I've suffered for six months, so I will go and take that holiday. They also have an element of wanting to take revenge on the pandemic by saying, I'm going to do this to enjoy myself, to get my own back on you. And I think there's also a sort of Damocles. I think what people fear is that if I don't do it now, the pandemic may come back, governments may stop me. So I will. And we've certainly seen that. So when a resort's open and someone can get to us, so whether it be in um, outside Jakarta or whether it be in uh, Bali, if it's open and people can travel, we know they will. We, they know they'll enjoy themselves. The trouble, of course, is that then inevitably that tends to shut down and move around again. So we've seen domestic tourism is important, and we think that's a trend that will continue. We think So we have invested in new resorts, 
uh, Karma Salak, just outside Jakarta, which is really designed so that our members and new members in Jakarta have somewhere to go. If they can't travel to Bali, it's local. Uh, we bought in Udaipur in India. We have one outside Bangalore. We have a beautiful new one in England called Karma Salford Hall, which is a, a Tudor mansion, used to belong to Henry VIII in the Cotswolds. It's an hour from London, so our clients there. So very much the logic has been on these resorts if someone can't travel internationally, they can still have the karma experience close to where they are. And then when the world opens up, other people will want to come to those properties as well. And what we see happening in the future is domestic tourism will continue. I think a lot of people have discovered, rediscovered domestic destinations that they wouldn't have gone to before. But as soon as they can travel internationally, they will with that same logic. And I think another driver on the international travel is I think a lot of people have used their lockdown time almost designing a bucket list of places they want to go to and we, we all have it i think a lot of people have said for instance in jakarta they may have always dreamt of going to tuscany um and and but every year there's a reason not to do we have the money it's a long flight we have a wedding coming up and i think this lockdown has made people think well no damn it i will go and do that as soon as i can so i think there'll be a rush of people doing that and, and of course that's great for us because as, as a micro example we have our resort in tuscany which is beautiful and so we see it being populated so yes we we have been very eagerly acquiring new resorts i mean we are um, we, we, we have cash constraints, of course, everyone does, but we're relatively liquid. We don't have debt. We, we had a quite a good reserves and we've seen it. And I, I, I don't like, I'm always very nervous about saying it's positive that we're buying resorts. It is, but I don't want to be seen as a, some kind of a vulture. So we always try and get a fair mutual deal rather than something which is taking advantage of someone's um, distress because that doesn't generally give good karma. But it is a time not necessarily that you're getting cheaper resorts to buy, but people are more motivated to want to do a deal. And so, as I said, during this period of time uh, um, in India, we, 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 we have one outside Bangalore, we have one at Udaipur. We're currently negotiating a beautiful desert safari camp near Jaisalmer, where you can go out on camels and trek in the things. In Indonesia, Karma Salak, just outside uh, Jakarta, and we have three or four more we're negotiating. We announced last week our newest one in Vietnam, in Hoi An, which is a beautiful property on the river there. In England, as I said, it's um, Salford Hall in the Cotswolds. We are about to launch a new one in Scotland, which is quite nice, on a lock up in the Highlands. And elsewhere, uh, in Egypt, we're negotiating buying a 50-cabin cruise ship that does a trip from Luxor to Aswan and up and down and visits all the sites and the Valley of the Kings and all that kind of stuff. And I go from here in a week or so over to um, Andalusia, where we're buying a resort in the hills behind Marbella. So, yeah, I mean, look, uh, people say, I, 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 someone said to me the other day, there's two sorts of people in the world at the moment. There's those that see a door ahead and are worried about opening it because it's going to lead to a black hole. And there are those that see the door and can't wait to open it because it leads to a bright new dawn and beginnings. And I like to feel I belong in the second one. Or, as I said to someone the other day in an interview, time will tell whether what I'm doing now is smart or incredibly bloody stupid. <laughs> it has to be one thing or the other. <laughs> John, it seems to be very smart so far as I can hear. Um, look, uh, we, we're going to have quite a few people in Jakarta listening to you. Tell us a little bit more about uh, Salak, because that is, as you said, on the doorstep of about 25 million locked down people here. Uh, uh, that's uh, relatively new, is it not? Because um, I haven't been there. I'm looking forward to going and seeing what it's all about. And Gunung Salak is a beautiful area, just gorgeous and cool, relatively cool. Yeah, I, I fell in love with it. I mean, I, I've only seen it once. <laughs> so I, I could tell you something. No, that's the irony, of course, of lockdown. There's a number of resorts. I haven't seen my ones in India, of course. I haven't been there. So we are having to buy, not sight unseen, because we have expert people locally, and they, they have a better view of it probably than I do. But but no, I, I, I saw it once. I went there, and we're looking at some other sites um, within about a two-hour, three-hour drive of Jakarta as well. And I must admit, I was very surprised, because I... And again, I could be very easily criticized here for my naivety. But in all the years I've been in Indonesia, I really haven't spent time exploring areas like where Salak is. I've, I've been in and out of Jakarta and you travel around and I've been blind to a certain extent to some of these opportunities. And I think that's one thing that 
this whole COVID thing has done to me and many of us in the world. It's opened our eyes to maybe, maybe some opportunities that we wouldn't have looked at before. But we've had to try harder. So, yes, it's about an hour, between an hour and an hour and a half outside. We know the, the tyranny of the traffic, but I thought that road was superb that takes you out there. And once you're up there, it's a different world. I mean, I, I, I the, sc the scenery was beautiful and the volcanoes in the background and the people are charming and it did a extremely good nasty gorings, which they tell me the best, but I'm sure everyone says that they got the best nasty gorings. But I, I did, I, I, I fell in love with it. And I thought that it's, I can see why it's so attractive to people from Jakarta and the area. And, and one thing again, that I've been saying to my owners a lot when I, I do a weekly sort of podcast or video cast with the owners. One thing I think is really positive from this is, for instance, our Australian owners who are, we have maybe 10,000 members in Australia, uh, they would normally only go to Bali. And I said, the great thing about these new acquisitions is it may be in the short term, it's mostly for people from Jakarta that are locked down and can get up there for the weekend or whatever. But once the storm passes, all our international people will be going to these places and totally rediscovering new areas. And, and understanding much more about different parts, more, I wouldn't say hard to get parts, they're not hard to get, but, 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 but perceived hard to get to parts of the countries. So when someone comes to Bali, they'll also be going to, to Salak, and hopefully we're looking at some other places um, um, down near Yogyakarta and various other places that we'll be acquiring. In the same way as uh, when someone goes to England, an Indonesian client, they may well discover the Cotswolds for the first time ever, or they may end up on a loch in Scotland being eaten by a Loch Ness monster for the first time. But they've never do been you there. know which loch in Scotland you are on, John? I, I do. I've home been country. There. I do. I understand that. So, yeah, you, however long you're in Indonesia, you've still got that Scottish accent there. And uh, <laughs> you might call yourself Pac Alistair, but it's still it's Mac Alistair, I think. Anyway. It is. It is. It is. Absolutely. Do you, do you remember? No, I, I know exactly where it is. I can't do it because I have a confidentiality agreement. Let me, let me just tell you this. It's, you, you can probably picture it. It's, it's within an hour and a half of Edinburgh and an hour and a half of Glasgow. So you can triangulate roughly where that is. Okay. It is a, it's literally at the beginning of the Highlands. And so as you get there, if you, if, if, you were, if you went north from there, you're almost straight away up into the Highlands. If you went south, it's that period of the hour before, before you get to the Highlands, if you know what I mean. And it's right on the lock, and it has. You'll love it, and I, I hope to announce it next week. It's got fishing rights. It's got. Uh, it's got you know uh, shooting rights. Uh, it's got its own brewery. It's got its own whiskey distillery. It's got its cider making factory, and it looks like a Scooby Doo sort of spooky Scottish castle on the side of the lock. So it's wonderful. Absolutely perfect. Um, I, I know where you are. It's um, it's it's a lovely spot. Um, and. and I, I, I will. I won't try and guess, but somewhere about but Lochley, Locker, and Head, somewhere about there. I should think. Yes. Uh, John, the future. You've already had vision from the past till now, from 1984 in Tenerife. Here we are in 2021, uh, very quickly turning into 2022. What's the next five years going to bring you? You, you seem to be everywhere you're going into spain you're doing uh, your scottish adventure is there anything left to do uh, yeah of course of course of course i mean the world <laughs> world's a big place i mean i i uh, it's, i think if we talk about the next five years if we talk about the industry first i think there's going to be a boom in in tourism and travel going back to the points i said before i think when we come out of this pandemic and we will come out of this pandemic and the, the covid will be with us forever but it will be controllable through vaccines i mean that's very much my fundamental belief it's what i've spouted off all along and it's what we're seeing here in europe get the vaccine out get herd immunity and we can live with covid i don't think it'll disappear and there'll be new strains and new variants but we're very resilient beings humans and i have every confidence we'll carry on and i think like often when you have pandemics or you have wars or you have social um problems it's followed by a boom period and just as it was in the 20s or just as the other time you can point to i think we're going to see a boom in travel in the next few years I worry whether that boom will be followed by social unrest and other problems, because if you look at history, that is generally what happens, because inequality gets widened in the boom. So if you ask me for the five years, I have a positive outlook. After five years, I'm slightly more concerned at the moment, but that's a long way off. So we worry about that when we get to that period. From a company point of view, we're going to keep doing what we do, to be honest. I mean, when I was... Um, I, I, I did an interview a few months ago and the interviewer had a very interesting comment because we were discussing a similar sort of thing and how I like to have lots of resorts 
I like having lots of small resorts. Unlike most developers, I don't like having two, three, four hundred room properties, even though they're more cost effective and make you more profit. I like having lots of 30, 40 room resorts all over the world. I like having flags in the sand. And that's what our, our clients like, because you can visit them and you can travel amongst them. And we very much have clients that like to tick off and collect coming to our destinations. So we have people that will physically go to as many as they can and take pictures of themselves in as many these destinations. And it becomes fun. How many karma resorts can I go to? And, and the interviewer said, did you have any hobbies when you were a child? I said, did you collect stamps? And I said, well, I did actually, I was a stamp collector. I said, oh, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to collect resorts all over the world like you used to try and collect stamps all over the world. And there is a certain element of that about my psychology. I, really, I love personally to travel to different places. I have a very childish fascination or love for getting on a plane, the door shuts, you relax for 10 hours, you get off the other side of the world, the door opens, a whole new world of opportunities and experiences and things out there. I, 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 apart from my three months during lockdown when I had to, I could never just stay in one place. It just drives me insane. And so that comes across in my philosophy of our resorts. I love having resorts in different places. So people can go to different places, have different experiences. And we take this karma sort of five star hippie philosophy all over the place. So I next five years, I would anticipate keep on developing new resorts, keeping on going to new areas. I'm very, very keen on the Caribbean, Central America and South America that I will definitely be looking at seriously. We've, we've almost done several resorts there. None of them have quite come off, but we're looking at a distance for some in Brazil. There's a little island in the Grenadines um, in the Caribbean that we're looking at a joint venture on. So I can see karma growing into that part of the world uh, as being, I feel like, our next our next territory. I mean, Europe is populated quite nicely now and we'll continue to add more. India, Southeast Asia will continue to grow. I mean, I always say to people, it's all we wanted to do is make money. We would just build resorts in Indonesia and India and just market to Indonesians and Indians. But we like being more global in our reach than that. So we'll definitely be doing many more. And, and in the Indonesia, I mean, again, it's one of those, as I said before, I wouldn't say an epiphany, but it's certainly a realization that there's many destinations in Indonesia which will not only be attractive to our Indonesian clients in Jakarta and Surabaya, but also to the international people coming over there. So expect to see more in Sulawesi and um, Sumatra and various beautiful locations. I'm very glad to hear that. Um, John, we've come to the end of our time. We thank you very much for the great insight you've given us, both the history and the development and the future vision of karma. I mean, it just sounds like great fun. You've just had a, a great time and you're giving people a great time, uh, for which we thank you very much. Um, I'm looking forward to Gunung Salak and certainly to Lochside in Scotland when I'm back home. Um, on behalf of all of us here at Now Jakarta, Now Bali, we've, we've been working with you now well, since you started um, in uh, Bali. We'll continue to work with you and we love what you're doing. We thank you very much for being with us. So from lockdown in Jakarta to happiness in Mykonos, we say goodbye until we meet again. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Joseph. It's a pleasure to talk to you. See you again soon. See you for beer when this lockdown finishes. <laughs> Absolutely.